Hello everyone. At the time of recording, a new film adaptation of Frank Herbert's classic science fiction novel Dune is about to be released. It's got me thinking about the books again, seriously, for the first time since I initially read them in my mid-teens. Um, and while I'm probably not likely to come back to the novels just yet, although I might do in the near future, um, it seemed a good opportunity to look into the video game adaptations of the series. So please join me for this video as we take a look at 1992's Dune, developed by Cryo Interactive. One opening to a video game. That's incredible. I don't know how that works for you, but I'm already feeling transported to a combination of the the music, uh, Stefan Peek's music soundscape, and the, that sequence of images. They seem to be in correspondence with each other, but I haven't quite got the context to put it into uh, a coherent meaning. Um, I just know I've had visions of people and places. I'm not quite sure if I should be hearing voices. Um, I'm not sure if I recognise anybody, and in fact, yeah, that is Agent Dale Cooper from Twin Peaks. Uh, Kyle McLaughlin does appear courtesy of MCA, and and the credits confirm, as well as the likenesses, that this is an adaptation of the novel in combination with the 1984 film directed by David Lynch. There's quite a lot to unpack there just in that little sequence. In these times of the future, man has explored many worlds, travelling through space by the use of the spice. Spice, the most precious substance, can only be found on one planet in the whole universe. This planet is Arrakis, better known as Dune. It's a dry, desolate planet with vast deserts. There's never a drop of rain on Dune. You are Paul Atreides, son of Duke Leto Atreides. The Harkonnens, long-time enemies of your family, have come on Dune to control the spice production in their brutal way. But the Emperor of the Universe has just allowed you and the Atreides family to go on Dune too. You are determined to use this opportunity to drive the Harkonnens out of Dune with the help of the few natives, the Fremen. The story begins as you've just arrived on Dune in an empty palace located at a safe distance from the Harkonnen fortresses.
and here we have the game's copy protection where you need to consult the manual to find this picture. Um, so it's worth mentioning here that uh, I'm playing the Amiga version. Uh, I do have the manual here beside me which I can flick through. Um, I'd also like to mention that the, the manual is quite interesting in that it dedicates 15 pages to um, the context for the game, which I think is, is quite unusual for, for the um, manuals that I've read for games. It, um, it has a section for the introduction to the general concept of the game. Um, it's got a section about Frank Herbert and the novel Dune. It's got a section about the film adaptation of Dune, uh, on which this is nominally based. And it's got um, a section about the developers of the game as well, which is is very interesting. And uh, and yeah, so it takes up 15 pages before it gets to the actual game instructions themselves. And at the bottom of most of these pages, there is quite an intriguing still from the uh, the game. the The game is composed of of interesting images, and uh, I've got to find this one which appears to show trees growing in the desert. That's at the bottom of page 24. So here we are in gameplay after that interesting two-part introduction, which I think I'd like to come back to in a moment. But um, may I draw your attention to the um, the soundtrack once again? This is, I believe, the um, the second of three tracks that there are in the game. Stefan Peek was uh, responsible for the the sound design and much of the composition of the uh, the music for the game. Also composed music with uh, Philip Ulrich, who was the um, sort of the overall uh, project manager for the game. But together they can composed enough music to comprise an entire CD album soundtrack which was released alongside the game. Uh, I'm sad to say that um, as with the game the soundtrack is now long since out of print um, but hopefully you'll hear as we go along the, um, the richness of the, the soundscape that they've created. Stefan Peek, uh, to, to my mind anyway and in my experience, is, is one of the great innovators of video game music. This was in uh, 1992, and um, many of the systems didn't have um, the ability to reproduce a sophisticated a, a soundtrack as the, um, the Amiga did. So that was kind of a natural home for for his interest in uh, this vast array of texture. So um, from kind of what we think of more as foley sounds. Um, through lots of different instrument voices and experimenting with um, lots of different musical influences, rhythms that you don't typically hear in, uh, in soundtracks in, in film or in video games. Um, so hopefully that will, that will shine through a little bit. It's a good opportunity to talk about the, the team who made the game as well. So um, I've mentioned uh, Stefan Peek and Philip Ulrich, Remy Herbulo and uh, Patrick Dublanchette primarily the, the programmers and I guess the uh, the designers of the uh, of the game um, and it was a, quite a small tight team that that had been working together for a, a while as um, they were known as a uh, cryo team at this point and um, after detaching themselves from Virgin Games they would go on uh, to be known as cryo interactive um, and they may be familiar to you through that um, before this they had been known as Exos and had um, been kind of quietly and with um, with their own sphere of success um, been making interesting um, usually science fiction based games that seemed outwardly um, obtuse and probably quite esoteric but essentially were kind of fundamentally well constructed recognizable genres of games I would I would say so there was for example there was uh, Captain Blood um, which is actually I might describe that to you as um, describe its plot to you as that would perhaps give you a hint as to why they might have been put forward for this game so Captain Blood is a ostensibly really a point and click adventure game and it was uh, the story of a game developer 
who had been drawn into the world of their own uh, space opera game, only to find that they'd been cloned multiple times, and each clone had taken a portion of their their life essence, their their life fluid, I believe it's described as. So the the uh, the developers called it's just called Captain Blood, and they have to go around the galaxy to find these clones and uh, and essentially reincorporate their uh, their essence uh, back into themselves. So that that is even weirder than it sounds uh, from from what I've seen, um, but that might give you an idea as to why they're uh, perhaps offered a uh, a rather high concept alternative world space opera. Um, they went on to make Purple Saturn Day, which is very stylistic um, and science fiction themed, but essentially a series of um, of mini games, sports based or puzzle based mini games. Um, they made Cult, which is a um, also, I'd say it's a point-and-click adventure game, but the uh, the style and the theming is is very interesting. It's science fiction, but it is um, almost body horror in its uh, its approach. And uh, once again, the Stefan Peak is providing very interesting soundscapes to go along with the, uh, the quite extraordinary images that the the team were able to produce. So they were developing, I believe, primarily for the Amiga. Um, and we're able to take great advantage of its advanced um, graphics capabilities. I mean, for the time, this was a, this was a high resolution um, and a great number of um, colors. Um, the Amiga certainly has its own unique palette, um, which lent itself to, to quite rich imagery and the obviously the, the sound um, capabilities that we can hear as well. So they, they did those. They went on to uh, make Extas, which was a development of one of the um, puzzle games from Purple Saturn Day. We've played that on this channel a little bit, so um, feel free to check out those videos to, to see what that's all about. Um, but that was uh, very interesting in that it was a very simple click to, to perform an action, um, kind of time sensitive puzzle game uh, with a dynamic soundtrack. So the, uh, the soundtrack would alter um, and the the um, interaction noises, so the sounds essentially were were musical and and part of the, the soundscape, and everything changed as as the game changed. Um, so that was a, a very interesting thing, and again an an experimental attempt to to push the games in different directions. So we come to the point where um, they're essentially under the auspices of the French branch, they are a French team, they're under the auspices of a French, the French branch of Virgin Games, Virgin Loisir, and Martin Alper, the, uh, I believe the president of Virgin Games USA, had um, independently acquired the rights to produce an interactive adaptation of Dune, um, having uh, untangled that out of the, the mess of rights left over from the not very successful a very financially successful June film adaptation in 1984. Cryo and I believe Remy Urbulo were trying to pitch uh, game ideas to Martin Alpa and he wasn't so interested in those but he did throw back to them that they could try and make a an adaptation of Dune from the, the license that he'd acquired um, and so production began on on this game and we'll come back to that story I think in a in a moment. There are two questions I'd like to bear in mind as we start to play. What kind of game is this and what kind of adaptation is this? And I think we can start to start to piece together some information from that just as as we look through this room. So it might at first glance appear to be a point and click adventure game, but we're not getting any highlights from, from this room apart from if you have a look at this this very careful, symmetrical, um, very stylish uh, room view, which kind of suggests the um, same kind of interface as a as a third person graphical adventure game. Uh, the only person, or the only thing that stands out compositionally, is this person who's off center. As we hover over them, uh, you can see in the the bottom middle uh, of the um, the interface there that we we've got two options available to us, and the second one, Duke Leto Atreides, is is the one that's highlighting. So that kind of indicates a person that we can we can interact with. But apart from that, I don't think we can click on exits. I don't think we can click on symbols. We can't right click. And the uh, what appear to be guards flanking the doors don't seem to do anything. So it's not really a, a point and click 
adventure in the sense of uh, the, the pixel hunters where you'd, you'd comb a picture for, for visual information. This is more a uh, graphical representation um, to help ground where we are and um, a really big part of the, the atmosphere and um, like in terms of visual storytelling anyway, a big part of the, the storytelling of the game. So that's, that's what's going on there. So let's have a look at the, the part we're actually going to interact with because this is this is really a menu-driven game. So we seem to have some information over here. Uh, there's a book icon here. Um, you may have noticed, uh, as I was talking earlier, that the, the sun symbol has been moving across this dial um, during the course of my, my introduction. Um, that assumes suggests that this game is happening in uh, with its own sense of real time as well, which is very interesting. We're now coming into night. And there are two, appear to be two empty slots here, which suggest we're going to pick something up at some point. So there seem to be action options in the middle, so we can pr probably address uh, the person in the room, or we can see the gene map. And then on the right hand side here, rectangle with uh, four potential arrows coming from it, and a red red spot in the centre. As you might have guessed, that's that's um, kind of a map indicator really. It shows, represents the room we're in and possible exits from it. So it's showing a, a, an exit in front of us, an exit behind us, an exit to the side of us, which is kind of contrary to what we can see on screen in that we can see two doors heading away from us. But let's try, let's try clicking one of these to start with. Where are you going so fast? I have to talk to you. So, uh, Duke Leto is, is talking to us and we get a, a character portrait and you can you can see some of the um, the animation that's on offer in the, the faces and you can see the design of the characters. Um, so well, one thing that I'm going to keep coming back to um, about this game is how stripped back it is. If you're looking at it as a point and click adventure, it's really taken to the, the bare minimum. So conversation is, is really stripped down. That might be something to do with it being um, developed sort of cross cross language by a French team, uh, primarily to be um, uh, marketed in English um, and also translate to other languages as well. So keeping it as as simple as possible is probably a benefit there. Um, so let's let's see. So you'll see you will come come to see that these are the standard options for uh, all conversations. So there'll be always be a talk to me, a come with me and a stop talking option and other things will occur as conversations happen. So let's talk to Duke Leto. I am the Duke Leto Atreides, your father. So <laughs> for me this this really adds to the, um, the really strange dreamlike quality that's already pervading this game because there's a there are very loaded sets of circumstances in which someone will tell you that they're your parent. Um, and if that's something that was both implicitly known by both parties, then it it, it feels like a dream to, to state that out loud. So come with me. No, I have to stay here. Okay, do you have anything else to say, Giglito? My son, we must mine the spice as soon as possible or the Emperor will recall us from June. We spotted three troops of Fremen around the palace and I've sent Gurney Halleck to meet them. He's not returned yet. Go there and see what's keeping Gurney. Okay, so that's our first, our first uh, mission, our first hint. Uh, so I think a good thing to look at now is the book. So here, this is going to be our uh, I guess a bit, a bit of our help and a bit of backstory to the game world. So you can click all topics, and that will go through all pages. There'll just be one page on each topic that you can, you can read, and they'll unlock as we go along. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to read these because they're, they are quite short. So we'll start with politics. Paul Atreides arrived on Dune with his father, the Duke Leto Atreides, and his mother, Jessica. They settled in the deep desert in a palace once occupied by their half and enemies. Caladan is the Atreides home planet. So we can have a look at Paul on Dune. On Dune, the desert covers the entire planet, also called Arrakis, or the Sand Planet. 
Dune is known as the only place where the most valuable substance in the universe, the spice, can be found. Weather, no precipitations. A few natives, the Fremen, live hidden in the desert. Let's have a look at spice. And the Duke said to Paul, My son, we must mine the spice as soon as possible, or the Emperor will recall us from Dune. So that's kind of like a, mi a mission log, which is very interesting. Um, so that's that's all we can get from our book at the moment. So I'll click on the picture of it again to ooh, get the credits. Um, well, I'll actually just click on the rectangle to the right, and that's how we get out of it. Um, I'm not sure if you can click on the day night cycle. We can't, and nothing on these empty squares. But as you may have guessed from uh, the interaction come with me, we can eventually pick up companions um, for our adventure. So the only other thing to do, apart from navigate to another room, is have a look at the Dune map. Dune map. Map to command rally, rally troops. Number of rally troops, zero. So immediately this is telling us that there's, there's kind of a numerical strategic part to this game as well. So um, this is like a geographical map. We've got um, the Palace Carthag held by the Atreides. So it's got that, that falcon, that red falcon symbol that's uh, for House Atreides. And then these locations stand out a bit, look a bit like cave entrances. They're Sietches, they're homes of the Fremen. So there's three on the map, uh, much as um, Duglito described. So there's Carthag Harg, Carthag Timin, Carthag Tuek. So those are three places we're going to have to look for Gurney Halleck. We've got a little navigator in the right here where the map was before. And so with that we can kind of step um, square by square around this map. But you'll notice also on the left that we have a picture of a globe. Let's try clicking on that. Yeah, so you get this incredible uh, screen. I mean, it's this incredible... I do really love um, how in, in pixel art um, the artists have rendered the entire entirety of the planet um, speeding on its axis um, and I also love the very um, very elaborate um, border around it which I don't think has any practical purpose but it's kind of uh, lining up all the different factions in the in the story which is I think it's a wonderful embellishment so what we can do here is uh, I think we can the globe rotates all by itself because time is moving um, but we can kind of navigate uh, in the cardinal directions, I think, with our arrow there. So we could get to the pole and then see it rotating on its axis there. Um, and what, ooh, whoa. That's very swirly. Is that, am I fast forwarding and rewinding time? Because it does very much look like it. How strange. So I believe the blue arrow points to where we are and if I hover over that we can see the map of the area so if I click to a point on the map you get to see it in detail and you can inspect what's there so potentially we're going to have access to the entire planet for, uh, for strategic purposes and we'll be able to give orders to troops see spice density and take an ornithopter uh, which is this world's um, aerial craft I always assume from the um, the description of it and the linguistic roots of it that it's kind of be, it's supposed to be like a, um, a bird-like helicopter. Um, but we'll, we'll see what um, this game uh, thinks it should look like. So we can exit the globe. We can see our results. So what's what's going on? So this is this is our strategic uh, map. So you can see how much of the planet is occupied by the Harkonnens, how much by the Atreides. Um, so this kind of sets up a, a strategic stake in terms of control, charisma, which is interesting, uh, and spice production. Oh no, so charisma is the, is the numerical value, zero, which I assume is not good. Uh, spice production is this graph here, um, and obviously we, we're not doing anything, we've only just arrived, and the Harkonnens have large control over this area around the uh, the North Pole, which I believe is is true to the, the novel, as, uh, as I remember. Um, so we can exit the globe, standard vision, which I think is back to that view we were on before. And this is also an opportunity to save and load the game. 
Um, so you have access to this map from various points in the game. You can save and load here. Uh, there's also another place to save the game, which I'll, I'll show you in a moment. Um, I think... Ooh. I think it resenders you if you click on the globe here, which is excellent. But let's come out of this screen, if we can. I think if I click in the centre, does that... Oh no, I need to exit maps, that's right. So it's not entirely consistent all the way through how you enter and exit things, but I found it pretty fairly intuitive to, to get into these things. Um, I was surprised that at the lack of interactivity in the, the room view. Um, and I, it does uh, bring to mind the, the early graphic adventure games that I played, um, where you're using a text parser. So it is essentially all kind of a command driven. Um, and the what's on screen is, is an illustration of, of what you're experiencing. So let's go through this door here. So, I mean, we can already tell this is, this is um, part adventure game, part strategy. And looking at the, uh, the reference book that we have and the, the st strategical map that we have as well, um, I can tell that it's adapting the novel kind of with a, a great deal of closeness of spirit, um, but with greatly stripping down the, the details of it because the, um, the novel is, is very textually dense and has, has a, a great stock of its own mythology and history attached. Um, and it's, that's why it has appendices that explain various elements of the world. And and has a uh, a map before before you even start the novel of the um, the key locations on Arrakis. Um, so uh, it's nice to see that these are kind of both reflected in the game, um, and I, I've assumed a role as part of the the way it tells its story. Now in this room, we've only got one exit. We're going to go back the way we came. Uh, there's only one thing we can do that's unique to this room, which is look at mirror. So I kind of assume this is this is Paul's bedroom probably. Um, it seems to be a bed in the centre and a, a desk to one side and a bookcase on the other. Let's look at the mirror and see what happens. Here we go, so we get to see the, the portrait of Paul again. So it's the likeness of Karl McLaughlin as, as portrayed in the, um, the 1984 film. And this is where we can... Uh, where we have the majority of our game control commands. So we can restart, load, save and exit or look away from the mirror, which is a, a really interesting command. I kind of love this feature. It's a, it's a really eccentric way to implement a basic menu system for, for controlling the game. Um, it's kind of its fundamental level. Um, and it, it kind of is a reflection of, of several things, really. It's, it's weaving in that weird kind of almost resemblance to the film. Um, because we are looking at Carl McLaughlin, um, but it's also got the kind of weird twitch animation, um, which is not quite naturalistic um, and not quite real. So it, again, I'm kind of at a distance and, and I'm feeling this is kind of a, a dreamlike experience um, because I, I recognise the face and also the, the face doesn't look quite natural. and. And it's us. We're so we're. This is supposed to be our body, and we're looking into a mirror. So this is this is the reflection, um, which I think is a, a really interesting thing because uh, I find a lot of the novel to be quite interior, um, and I think uh, that's kind of reflected in the the, the nineteen eighty four film as well, because um, unusually um, it for film in general really, um, you do hear snippets of dialogue from from people's interior thoughts which is, you know, something not recommended by most uh, screenwriting handbooks. But it is part of the spirit of, of Dune, at least as it is in the novel. Um, and it's interesting that carries through into the, the, um, the film. And I, I like that, for me anyway, this is, this is a reflection of that. So we, we won't save just yet, we'll look away from the mirror. Um, because I'll have to do some disc swapping business for that. So we won't do that just yet. But let's see, so we, we had tried to go down before, but let's go to the side instead and see what's there. So here we've got a, a completely empty room. 
It feels like it's it's waiting for something. We can see some kind of uh, perhaps aircraft on on this uh, landing pad here. You can see the the edifice of the building and this this balcony, but there's no commands that we can we can fulfil here. There's no other exits. So let's go back from there and head down. That was the only other way. Now let's see who who we have here. Interesting, another symmetrical composition. Um, I do love the the very sort of gold or brass style of this this palace that we're in. It's situated with the green banners and the the, the red logos, and um, and yeah, it, our attention of course is drawn to the off center character, who is Jessica. So I wonder what Jessica's got to say to us. I'm your mother, Jessica. So once again, that that strange. Um, kind of dissociation that seems very dreamlike. The Duke has sent Gurney Halleck to Carthag Tuick. Ah, so we know exactly where to go now. Go outside, take an awning and fly there. Hurry up, my son. I sense danger. Interesting. Okay, Jessica doesn't want to talk to us anymore about that topic. Um, oh, and if I click talk to me, that's the end of the conversation. How about come with me? I don't think I need to be at your side. Okay. So, yeah, the um, it's kind of the fact that it's partly based on the film, um, and there are some likenesses and some that are not. Uh, is is really interesting. So, I mean, I think the only uh, actors I've I've recognised as being um, faithfully reproduced are Carl McLaughlin and Francesca Granis as Jessica. Um, I, I know in the introduction we had uh, a glimpse of Fade Relta who kind of looked a bit like Sting, but uh, kind of a yeah, a, a budget a budget variety Sting I think. Um, so let's let's keep going. Uh, do we want to go down again? I think we do. Yeah. So we get this. Yeah. So we change perspective again. So we're almost up in the air looking at this long corridor. And then we're in this very green uh, bay, and we can only go. We can go back. Um, we can go forwards. Ah, and here we are. I think this is probably where we could see from our balcony, which might be up there. So here we can take an ornithopter, which is really interesting. So let's let's do that and see what happens. Select destination on map. Okay, so this resembles the map we'd, we'd seen before. That's our palace. And then there are th the three locations we can get to, three sketches. Um, so we know Gurney Halleck's there. But we can we can choose to go somewhere else if we so wish. So up here, we know that there's Arakeen, home of the Harkonnen. So I'd kind of like to show you a little something that I found out about while experimenting with this game previous to recording. So here we get to see what, what this um, vehicle looks like. It looks kind of like a, um, a dragonfly to me rather than a bird, um, but I love the design of it. So between locations you get this um, this travel screen which uh, is kind of a kind of a featureless area um, which I find intriguing. I don't know if there's a possibility of discovering things while you journey, but there is also the option to skip to destination. Wow, I hadn't seen the colour change before. Oh, warning, entering Harkonnen zone. Okay, well let's... I'm going to ignore the warning because uh, perhaps perhaps we can talk to the Harkonnens, you know? Perhaps we can work something out. We can work together. Oh, I need to change discs. That'll take a little moment of uh, me shuffling things off screen. So this should do it. I'm really intrigued now, what's going to happen? <gasps> Did you see that? Our body disintegrated before our eyes. Aha! One day this Paul Atreides went flying over us. We shot down his ornithopter. He died somewhere in the desert. So these, um, these very stark looking, um, almost skeletal faced characters are obviously part of House Harkonnen. Um, and this arrow looks a bit like our don't know like a like some kind of aircraft and we um yeah we got shot down and and perished and it's jumped to day 365 
it's yeah so that's quite a thing to suddenly happen um so you know um i guess we just have to restart the game then because we didn't save um and what do you think it will do i, th I imagine it will just take us straight back to where we started right no we get reconstituted and we have those purple eyes um which is incredible so the <laughs> This kind of brings me back to where we started with the, that introductory sequence of um, almost connecting um, images, um, very striking images that don't quite have a context at the time. Because this this is uh, a game of visions as much as anything else, I think. And what's interesting is it hasn't mentioned in the text of the game, but in the in the book and in the no sorry in the novel and in the film. Um, before Paul comes to Arrakis, he has uh, a dream vision of things that are going to happen to him here. Um, and that's, that's essentially what, what the first introduction of the, the game is when you start it up. It's, it's, a, it's a premonition of all the things that will, will happen. But it doesn't explicitly tell you that. Um, and then you get the title, um, you get the credits, sorry. Um, and then uh, when you go on from there, you get the more prosaic, um, more expositional introduction to what the game is and, and what certain things mean and who they represent, which I think is fascinating. It's, it's yeah, it's a really interesting thing. So what we're going to do is we're going to, oh, that was misclick. Let's talk to Duke again. Hello, Father Duke. That's all we need to know there. I will talk to Jessica. So I think at this early stage, heading towards the Harkonnens is the only real danger of, uh, of destruction. So what we can do quite easily is uh, take our ornithopter to another location. So I'm, I know that's where we need to go, but I'm going to try the the northmost of these. So yeah, just, I'm curious to find out what's what they're all about and meet these fremen. And while we're traveling, I mean it's an interesting time to talk about the the competition aspect between the Atreides and the Harkonnen. So that's a that's a key component um, and a well a well revisited one in in adaptations. That these two these two houses are vying for control they have a, a, a long animosity um, and vying for control of Dune but it's kind of it's reflected in the the meta narrative of this game's development as well uh, because you can click you can click on the screen you can click on the sketch to go down I think I'm gonna hear some different music too and I might need to swap a disc no I don't fantastic yeah, so we get our next June, uh, June soundtrack. Yeah, so um, as I was saying, um, the game uh, got to a certain stage of development, uh, mostly on paper, and it was taken back to the um, the British and uh, uh, American team who would give it the, the great green light to go ahead. Um, um, and they didn't like how it was developing. So they effectively uh, said stop production on the game um, and Martin Alpa then went to Westwood Studios with the license and said would you like to make a game with this and that's how we get in the same year the release of Tune 2, a completely independent game that has its own view on how to adapt uh, the game, coincidentally as a real-time strategy game. Um, and, uh, and But this game shouldn't really have existed apart from the fact that um, Cryo team were allowed to keep working on it under the payroll of the French branch of Virgin. Um, so under Virgin Loisir they could still um, draw their paychecks and work on the game even though there was no guaranteed um, outlet for, for what they were making because they wouldn't necessarily have the go ahead from Virgin to re to to have them publish it, um, and they wouldn't be able to take it anywhere else without the license. 
So it was just the fact that they'd got so far with the game, then showed it to to the managers who um, who could say yes or no, and and impress them with it. That we got this game and Dune Two, um, which is is its own thing entirely, in in the same year. So they were. I, I don't even know how conscious the the two teams were of each other. I imagine uh, Westwood certainly weren't aware of. Um, Cryo's work as as uh, was entirely unofficial at the time. Um, I guess Cryo might have had some um, rumblings that somebody else was working on on a Dune game as well. But um, it's, it's kind of the the Harkin and Israeli situation in in the fact that the Emperor is uh, is pitting pitting houses against each other. Certainly at the point where it's kind of an ultimatum of you must finish this by a certain date um, and we'll release it else forget about it um but i think i think that's a really interesting um element to the backstory of this game but let's let's talk to talk to this person let's see what they've um they'd like to say to us or what we'd like to say to them we fremen are the original inhabitants of dune we've adapted our way of life to the desert first thing amazing hairstyle i love it uh second thing amazing suit look at that so this is this is going to be a still suit isn't it which is uh collecting uh the fremen's vital juices and uh to reference an earlier game um and uh and uh recycling them so that very little water is lost because water is at a premium on uh, arrakis that's that's uh, something i that's backstory i'm bringing from the uh from the novel and the film uh, but I just want to remark on the the colour and the design of it. This is so much more um, stylized and um, what's the word? I mean, it was very colourful, um, but it strikes me as much more reminiscent of uh, French bande dessinée, French comics, um, such as um, Philippe Drouillet um, with his kind of. They are. They. I think they. There's quite a close correspondence with this kind of game and this kind of story, in that um, they're sort of grand space operas, but they're also kind of um, uh, psychodramas as well. I think. I think that applies to both, both Dune and and that kind of that kind of work. Um, also, of course, uh, Mobius and uh, Jodorowsky. Um, and that's that. <laughs> Jodorowsky and Dune is another another conversation to be had. Um, but let's see. So we from the original inhabitants of Dune, we've adapted our way of life to the desert. We've heard of you. You're the son of the Atreides Duke and of Jessica. The could he be the one? Subtle subtle plot hint. Ellipsis. Interesting. So can we? Oh, we got the option for work for me. Yes, I agree to let my troop work for you. Give orders to troop. We're... Wow. My troop is settled in Carthag Hark, awaiting your orders. Ask for more information. 2,080 men. Motivation, 26%. Uh, I assume the higher percentage is the greater motivation. Select troop occupation. What can you do? Specialise in... Spice? We know a little about spice mining. Okay. Great, no more orders. So I think we're already we're already nailing this uh, this strategic game. Um, great. Did they move slightly across the screen? Are they in a different position from before? Or was that me? Great. So I think we just that, I think that's it. I think that's all we need to do here. Oh, I love the saturated colour at night time. It's fantastic. I'm taking all this after. Um, let's just go to the next one along. Timin. So this, um, in the early game at least, is is kind of a, a pretty laid back, um, pretty direct uh, adventure game interface and gameplay. Um, and um, yeah, let's talk to this Fremen. Ooh, very striking. 
I can feel something in you. I wonder if you'll be able to penetrate the secrets of this planet. I'll certainly try. Talk to me. Oh. Uh, work for me? I'm not quite sure that you're able to appreciate our skills yet. Hmm. Talk to me? Okay, I don't think this person is quite prepared to to work with us yet, which is fine. Um, so let's leave here. And uh, let's go check out what Gurney's up to. Because Gurney should be in this one, I believe. I love this deep purple. I mean, I don't think there's any colour scheme of this game that I don't like. It's um, it's very visually rich, very very striking, um, and full of character. Oh, nice! There's kind of a like an eye motif in the background there, or is it? Um, are those planets like a planet in a moon? So we've got Fremen and Gurney Hammock. So I guess we'll greet Gurney, who uh, presumably Paul already knows. Um, and so, oh, hi. Hi, Gurney. I'm Gurney Halleck. I served the Atreides for a long time. Did you notice that all the Fremen we met have blue eyes, totally blue, no whites in them? I did notice that. It's linked to saturation of the blood with spice. The Fremen seem to be organised in tribes or troops. It would best... It, it would best for us, it would be best for us to visit the three Sietches together and return to the palace to inform and inform the Duke. Okay, well, I've kind of been towards them, but let's talk to the Fremen. We saw you coming from the other Sietch. This is a very striking uh, face and outfit. Ellipsis. Okay. Um. Are you inclined to work with us? Oh, yes, I agreed to let my troop work for you. Great. Let's go to this map view. Um, let's have some more information. 1,900 men, motivation 28%. That seems to be a standard starting point. Um, can you specialise in army? Don't think my troop feels the necessity to fight for you. Fair enough. Um, how about spice? We aren't very used to spice mining. We'll try to we'll try to learn. Okay. So I mean that's like that's slightly different to the description we got in the other place. So I'm wondering if there's a qualitative um, description of a certain uh, skill level because they seem to have a slightly greater skill than the other the other location. Um, I wonder can we go to the globe view from here and look at our stats? We can. Okay. Let's have a look. So. Yeah, so we, we've attracted a number of men and some spice production already. So yeah, so we're on the way to um, to somewhere, aren't we? Let's go to a standard vision um, next to the globe. So this is fascinating. So I guess this is a representation of people, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, so it's showing the... We've been doing spice money for a very short time. Yeah, that's fine. No more orders. So I think, yeah, when we're in this view, we can just get in touch with everybody. Can we get in touch with everybody? Okay, they're flying an awning. Interesting. And I can't click on that person, though, for some reason. Well, never mind, because I'm pretty happy with our progress. Um, if I talk to Gurney, Let's go and tell the Duke that we have two troops working for us. Yeah, so I think that result is is all we need to do from the searches. You gonna come with me, Gurney? Okay, Paul, I'm going with you. Um, so let's see let's see what happens there. There we go. We've got Gurney in our in our party. So I think I'm not quite sure what Gurney's flashing. Oh, maybe it's just a settling in period. But I think we can talk to Gurney. Any? Whoa! Hi, hi, Gurney. Um, Let's go and tell the Duke that we have two troops working for us. We can talk to uh, Gurney any time and they'll pop... Whoa, okay, Gurney. Uh, how do I... Let's back up here. <laughs> I need a little bit of personal space, Gurney. It's, it's nothing uh, 
Uh, it's nothing to do with you, it's just I, you know, I just need a little bit of space. Um, let's take an ornithop, which is to be dawn. And we'll go back to the, the palace. So even if there's kind of no practical application to this travel screen, I I really like it. I like how it gives a sense of scale and scope to the planet and it reflects the real time travel um, and the, the sense of continuous time within the game. And it also gives you a sense of contiguous space as well, which I, I, I really like. Um, so let's go there, is that? The palace? I hope it is. I think in one way you can just walk into the desert, which is not advisable. There we go. So is that, oh no, so I want to go keep pressing up in this case. Ah, there's somebody else here. So it's Duncan Idaho. Should we talk to, we'll talk to Jessica first. Your friend Duncan is an expert on spice production. Interesting. Um, okay, I think that's all Jessica has to say. Let's talk to Duncan. I'm Duncan Idaho. Interesting hairstyle. The Duke asked me to supervise the production of spice. There's some uh, Londo Malari vibes going on there for uh, perhaps I look forward to Babylon 5, which wouldn't be. Uh, too far away actually from 1991. Um, okay, talk to me. Well, for the moment, I haven't much to do. I hope that we'll be able to extract large quantities of spice very soon. Well, I'm, I'm working on it, Duncan. If you really want to know about the properties of the spice, ask your mother, Jessica. Our stocks of spice are currently 30 kilograms. Okay, so that's yesterday we had produced 10 kilograms of spice, that is 10 better than the day before. Do you remember that spice is by far the most valuable substance in the whole universe and it can only be found here on Dune? So that's really interesting, that's that's character and story, it's giving us a little bit of plot isn't it? And it's also reinforcing the, the strategic element. I love, I love how that's melded together. Spice is mined from the sand of Dune. Spice prolongs life and extends consciousness. It's used by the guild navigators to travel through space. I wonder what the proximity of so much spice will do to you, Paul. That's ominous, isn't it? So already we're getting a suggestion of the, I guess, more abstract and esoteric reaches of of the Dune universe. Oh, the Duke's over there. Can't just do me around between screens, which is really nice. Um, and I assume they try and keep them off center. Um, that's what I do anyway. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. So I love how this is melding the different elements together. Um, in comparison to the other Dune game that was made uh, contemporary with this, um, which focuses just on the strategic competition between houses to gain dominance over the um, the spice resources um, and over each other, this is also interested in the. Uh, ideas of the the psychic properties of the spice and I think also it's going to be interested in the um, the religious uh, side of the novel as well um, which is, is really interesting so let's talk to the Duke the Fremen have a special garment which they call a still suit yes I was, I was talking about that earlier wearing this they can stay in the desert without losing any bodily water it would be advantageous for us to have some of these still suits. I want you and Gurney to go and find some of these suits for us. Remember, avoid wandering in the desert. You won't go very far without a still suit. Great. So Gurney's staying with us. I sort of Gurney. Oh yeah, still suits. Let me remember. That's it. The Fremen in the CH where we met told me about still suit maker. So that's our clue. Um, I don't know of a good way to get Gurney to pop away. But I must admit, I'm finding him a little distracting. Let's go to a different room, and maybe that will help. Yes, there we go. Um, I so it's it's really um, I'm finding it really intuitive to 
to play this. It's not really representative of the challenge of an adventure game, but I love how stripped back it is. It just gives you gives you just enough information uh, to get to the next point. The next point is simply and clearly made. Um, I think it's a great way of slowly unraveling um, a complicated fictional world, um, which is is what this has to wrestle with as an adaptation. Um, and I love I love how uh, graphical the interface is, although we're not really interacting with much graphically it's still pretty menu driven um, and we're selecting between text options mostly uh, it really strikes me as something akin to a, a visual novel or um, the pop-up heads that um, appear to tell you things that really strikes me as, as being something like a, a Nintendo DS game um, so I, I think in terms of being stripped back and modern, I think this game is, is pretty far ahead of its time and, and you can take take that as kind of a, um, a benefit or a loss as to, as to how refined it has become. Let's look at the mirror and save because we have made some progress, so let's give that a go. So I think, yeah, so I need to change to my save disk here because this is uh, this is Amiga floppies that we're we're dealing with. Guess I want that one. Thanks. So I think we've got two two slots. I think that's good. I think we're done. So I think it's day two, seven thirty a.m. No, but it's the evening, isn't it? I do have to select one. I do. Okay. Ah, okay, got it. Great, so we'll look away from the mirror there. And well, let's give it a go. Let's let's head back to the CH where we met Gurney and see see how the story unfolds from there. So I guess as a I guess it depends on the player as to how, how involving you'd find this, this part of the game. Ah, oh, I've just realised, look at the map, this looks like a, a fish skeleton marooned in the desert. That's that's really nice. Um, yeah, because this is, it's not very demanding on like an adventure game level, but it's, it's quite easy to make progress here. Um, so I think, oh well, yeah, we need to change back to the correct disc, here we go. So I think it's, it's pretty easy to get from point to point. I think that's part of the refinement that it shows. I thought you looked interested in my still suit. Definitely. They all look fabulous. Um, yes, I know a still suit maker. You'll find him if you fly eastwards in your Orny. It's not very far. Uh, but to be sure to fly with someone, but be sure to fly with someone, sketches are well hidden and not easy to find. My troop is settled in Carthag Turek. We've been doing spice mining for a few hours. Nice. Oh, and then I get us ah, on trial in spice. Nice. Since we started, we were extracting 33 kilograms of spice, an average of 3 kilograms per hour. Right now, we are doing 3 kilograms an hour. We aren't well equipped to extract spice, but we're trying to do the best we can. However, we'll be better with a harvester. There's a sketch not far from here eastwards. Interesting. So we're getting little hints. I'm going to start writing this, this down as we get more information. Um, so eastwards. Um, CH for still suits. Wood like harvester. So I, I I really like the two the two layers here, which are kind of um, thinly thinly uh, placed on top of each other. Uh, I think I'm going to end the video for for this session here very shortly. But let's just check in with our encyclopedia and see if we've got anything new to to read about. Paul first encountered the Fremen in a siege near the palace. Fremen are the first inhabitants of Dune. 
They live in sketches hidden in the desert. Their eyes are blue, totally blue, no whites in them, due to the saturation of their blood with spice. So that's a good recap of, of what we've learned. Um, let's leave here. So I, I'm kind of curious about the other um, CH, the one we couldn't recruit before. I wonder if now we've got two two groups working with us, I wonder whether they'll like to as well. We saw you coming from the other search. I can feel something in you. I wonder if you'll be able to penetrate the secrets of this planet. Okay, would you like to work with us? Mm, we're not able to appreciate their skills yet. That's fair. So they might have a, a special a special ability that we don't we don't quite know about yet. I'm tempted to return to the palace and see if um, if Duncan will come with us and then we'll go on an experimental flight eastwards after that I think okay so we want to head into the palace which I think is that one I think that's why there's a solid line for that direction rather than a dotted one. Great, and then we go up. Yes, Here we go. Um, Duncan. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We're building up our resources. Um, Duncan, would you like to join us? I can't now. I have some work left here. Fair enough. Yeah. Okay, um, what I'll do is while I'm here, I'll, I'll look in the mirror and save again. And I'll, I'll say farewell for this episode. We'll, we'll leave it off um, looking at our reflection in the mirror um, and wondering what adventures are to come. Thank you for joining me. See you soon. Take care.